Um, well, thank you for inviting me to talk about the key characteristics. Um, I know many of you are actually quite intimately familiar with this concept and some may it may be new to so apologies to those who already have seen a lot of this but um, I'm going to go through um, uh, the concept and sort of some of the latest things that we're thinking about. Uh, I just want to put up a conflict of interest statement just in case anybody's that concerned. Um, I do quite a lot of litigation work on behalf of plaintiffs in the United States. Um, so a quick summary. Um, scientific findings are providing insights into the mechanisms of toxicity and these are playing an important increasingly important role in hazard identification. Um, the key characteristics form a basis of a knowledge-based objective approach for evaluating mechanistic data in hazard evaluation that contrasts with the com and complements the reductive MOA and AOP approach. Recent uh, IARC monograph, EPA, Cal EPA and NTP evaluations have illustrated the applicability of this approach and the key characteristics of reproductive toxicants, endocrine disruptors, neurotoxicants, cardiotoxicants and immunotoxicants have or are being developed. And what's really needed now is a comprehensive set of biomarkers and assays to measure these key characteristics. Um, so uh, why do we need key characteristics? Well, we need them for evidence integration in identifying chemical hazards. So typically we use three um, streams of evidence. The first being human studies, mostly epidemiological studies, um, animal studies, usually in rodents, of course. Um, although we're just talking about fish, it could also be that. Um, and then mechanistic data, which can come from either humans, animals, or in vitro studies. And we have an increasing amount of uh, high throughput screening type of approaches in in vitro studies which are providing information and also biomarkers in humans and so this mechanistic data is becoming increasingly important as a stream of evidence in identifying chemical hazards. Now the problem with mechanistic data is it poses some serious challenges. Um, how do we search systematically for all the relevant mechanisms? How do we bring uniformity across assessments? How can one committee basically analyze mechanistic data in the same way as another committee? How can we analyze the voluminous mechanistic data efficiently? And how can, one of the most important things is how do we avoid bias towards favored mechanisms? And I'll come back to that in a little while. So the classical approach to mechanistic data has been hypothesis driven and you know as scientists we all love hypotheses um, and um, it typically involves in developing a mode of action and more recently this has been replaced by the adverse outcome pathway concept which is really a modification of the mode of action idea. The problem with that is that if you're going to regulate things is that a mechanistic hypothesis in science is really beneficial because if you're wrong, then that's great because you modify your hypothesis and get closer to the truth. Whereas in risk assessment or hazard identification, this is problematic because if you're wrong and you, you, make, you make a bad risk decision that cannot easily be changed, regulations take many years to actually implement. And you may have caused medical, um, harm by doing that and also economic harm in the other direction and so you don't really want to have to guess the mechanism in order to make some decision. There's also a tendency uh, of people to focus on favorite mechanisms which may introduce bias especially in committees. I often give the illustration that I think benzene works in a particular fashion and another scientist may think that benzene um, works in a different way on the bone marrow and depending on who's on the committee, that's going to be the, the basically the, uh, the, the, uh, the mechanism we go with. And there are examples where the mode of action may be incomplete or wrong, and many AOPs appear to be quite incomplete. Um, and then how many validated AOPs would you actually need 
for 100,000 chemicals producing hundreds of adverse outcomes in different ways. So the KCs could potentially help you build unbiased MOAs or AOPs if you're needed, but um, you may also uh, learn from existing AOPs uh, about future KCs. We're currently doing the key characteristics of cardiotoxicants with a group of about 18 people. And um, two of the things that come up in an AOP, abnormal intracellular calcium handling and uh, altered potassium currents, uh, potassium ion channels. These are both um, likely to be key characteristics of cardiotoxicants. So the National Academy looked at the key characteristics idea and improving risk assessment in uh, its uh, 2017 publication. And they concluded that um, the approach avoids a narrow focus on specific pathways and hypotheses and provides a broad holistic consideration of the mechanistic evidence, which is really what we want. They also noted that um, we should develop key characteristics for other hazards such as cardiovascular and reproductive toxicity, which is what we have done. The other interesting thing from why the California EPA has sponsored much of our work is that California is somewhat unique in that it has these particular things which are actually in the legislation called hazard traits. Um, there are 19 toxicological traits in this. There are also other traits such as potential for exposure and ability to cause environmental harm, bioaccumulation. And these are the properties of the chemicals, which are the hazards. And California is theoretically supposed to make decisions based on these hazard traits. So you need to gather information on all of these hazard traits in order to really regulate chemicals in California. So there are these are the toxicological hazard traits in California. And you can see that um, at the top is, is carcinogenesis and genotoxicity. This is why we focused really, we have the key characteristics of carcinogens first. It's also reproductive, neurologic, and cardiovascular and endocrine uh, and uh, immunologic. All of these are being developed at the present time or have recently been published. Eventually we hope to to get um, hazard traits and key characteristics for all these, these hazard traits. So this began really with the key characteristics of human carcinogens, a very large collaboration started by IARC actually as early as 2012, that ended up being a publication in 2016 with multiple authors and produced these 10 key characteristics, um, which are now known to, to many people and have been increasingly used. So examples of relevant evidence are things like, um, is there something electrophilic? Does it make an adduct? Does it cause DNA damage? Does it alter epigenetics? Does it produce oxidative stress? Um, does it produce chronic inflammation? Um, does it decrease immunosurveillance and suppress your immune system? Does it bind to a particular receptor or modulate endogenous ligands like hormones? Does it alter cell senescence? and altered telomeres and does it increase proliferation or decrease apoptosis and otherwise alter cell signaling pathways now many people say to me well these are all obvious and um, as somebody once said to me on a national academy committee never be afraid to state the obvious and this is the important part of this is it's meant to be a consensus objective idea that nobody really disputes that these are mechanisms by which um, um, uh, carcinogens pr can produce cancer. So the first paper was published in 2016. Uh, Kate Guyton and myself and others published then what uh, IARC's use of it and um, basically a very short summary of progress to date. And we've just published a paper that um, has just come out in Cancer Epidemiology, Biomarkers and Prevention. Um, showing how they're different to the hallmarks of cancer, which are the properties of cancer cells and development of relevant assays and biomarkers to measure them. 
And this idea of how we measure the cases is something we're working on right now. We've collected a group of people together to produce this paper in CBP, but we're now developing a web-based expert-driven guide to sort of all of the assays which could measure the different key characteristics of carcinogens. We hope to do this for the other endpoints too, with the ideas of looking at uh, what are the best tests for these key characteristics and what ones should we be skeptical of? How do you actually measure oxidative stress in people? What's the best way and things like this. So we're trying to, that's currently one of the major projects we have ongoing. And this um, is of great interest actually to the pharmaceutical industry and also perhaps the chemical industry in that they would really like an approach where they can reduce animal testing and do predictive toxicology. And uh, this is a paper by a group from um, Amgen who um, are very keen to develop these approaches and develop tests for the different key uh, characteristics to modernize human cancer risk assessment and better predict um, the possibility of carcinogenicity in their, in their studies. So we are not really alone in academia or in uh, consulting or others uh, in our desire to improve toxicity testing. And uh, this is one approach really that I think pharma have uh, understood could be very important and uh, are moving forward with it. Um, this just gives an example from the, of some of the uh, data we put together. Um, we can skip that for now, but obviously developing OECD standardized tests for things that relate to a particular key characteristic is critical. And the National Toxicology Program in the United States, led by Brian Berridge for the moment, is um, really keen on this idea of having the key characteristics advise them on how which test they should be focused on to develop. Um, some of you may recognize yourself on this picture. I need to go back, sorry. Um, uh, like Tom Zoller, who was in the top right there, um, with uh, Michelle Lamerell, they led the endocrine disruptors group on workshop of KCs. Um, uh, there is uh, Patience Brown there from OCD, Andrus Camp at the back, uh, and Gail Prince, who led the uh, helped lead the male reproductive toxicity with Xavier um, Azuega from EPA, and the female reproductive toxicants was led by Ulrike Ludero. So this group got together and uh, they've produced three papers uh, producing the three key characteristics of male and female reproductive toxicants and the key characteristics of endocrine disrupting chemicals uh, that Laura Vandenberg and Tom contributed greatly to uh, uh, along with Michelle in developing this papers. Uh, these are the key characteristics of endocrine disrupting chemicals as drawn by um, the artists at Nature Reviews Endocrinology. And um, not having a list of endocrine disrupting chemicals that everybody could immediately agree upon and rely upon, um, much of this was based on the mechanisms of hormone action and our knowledge of hormone action and how chemicals work to, uh, in, uh, to disrupt or alter this hormone action. And uh, this guided the uh, development of these EDCs um, the Tom Law, as I mentioned, were very important in developing. So these are the key characteristics of endocrine disruptors. The top two are kind of the obvious ones that everybody um, really thinks about with hormone receptors. They think about activation of particular agonisms or antagonism to hormone receptors. Um, there's also hormone receptor expression, of course, that could alter signal transduction in hormone responsive cells, again, epigenetic modifications. Again, another one that would be typically people would think of would be alters hormone synthesis. But then there's the intracellular transport of hormones, blood protein expression, which alters their distribution in the body, uh, their inactivation, breakdown and recycling and metabolism. And then actually things like hypertrophy and atrophy and things like this. Um, so one of the conclusions that came from this, I think uh, Jerry Heindel was one of the first to point this out, is that we have a lot of assays for some of these key characteristics, but practically none for others. And um, 
this sort of opens up, uh, shows the data gaps that we may have in looking at endocrine disrupting chemicals. So we're currently uh, writing a paper on neurotoxicants and developmental neurotoxicants, what the key characteristics of those. Pam Line is leading that along with Thomas Hartung from Johns Hopkins. Um, this has been disrupted somewhat by the COVID epidemic, uh, but we're hoping uh, that um, the paper will be uh, submitted soon and leading journals have expressed interest in publishing it. Uh, we're also currently working on the key characteristics of cardiotoxicants by Zoom, which uh, is a new experience of having 20 people on a call and all talking. Um, so, uh, but it's going very well. We've broken people into subgroups and uh, this group is, uh, I've got some very experienced people on it in the cardiotoxicant field and they are contributing greatly to this process. So how are the KCs being used and who is using them? Um, well, interestingly, they're being used by people like IARC, um, for example, their preamble now really includes the key characteristics as a way of looking at mechanistic data and making evaluations on mechanistic data. And it's now possible on the basis of mechanistic data alone to actually call something a possible or even a probable carcinogen. Um, the, uh, uh, they're also being used by the National Toxicology Program report on carcinogens. There's a paper they just put out on hyaluacetic acids and it's a case study. Um, really shows the uh, importance of the key characteristics in their thinking. Consulting groups have started to use it, such as Tox Strategies, to look at um, a systematic evaluation of the mechanistic evidence for the carcinogenicity of other chemicals. And then in people like the Environmental Working Group and on the other side of the spectrum uh, have, for example, applied them to look at uh, PFAS uh, in a recent publication. So they're being widely used by, by diff different groups and uh, uh, it being certainly being beginning to be more used by EPA in their evidence integration strategies. So this, um, they've, we now have experience of using the key characteristics in, I think, 13 monographs, 112 to 125. This is a slide that Kate Guyton made. Uh, just basically, um, actually was supposed to be presented at SOT this year, but we couldn't go. Um, and so um, uh, you can see here that quite a large number of chemicals, nearly about 50 or more, have now been evaluated with key characteristics. And um, we are finding out um, more and more about how, how useful they are and some of the pitfalls in using them as we apply them. So the real point about this for IARC was really that there are so many studies and so little time to evaluate them and IARC does a working group meeting usually it used to be in person uh, over nine days and they would look at all the epidemiological studies typically in that you only have tens to hundreds of studies usually actually only four or five um, you have studies of cancer in animals it says tens of studies often I've been on IARC committees where there's only one or two or three um, uh, long-term cancer bioassays, but there are thousands of papers to look at on the mechanistic data, 3,000 for PCBs, 2,000 for benzene. So how do you actually read 3,000 papers and what do you do? So, and how do you even search for it? So we've been working on search terms and systematic uh, uh, measurements of all these different search terms. Um, we want to bring uniformity across the assessment, so we want to have procedures that people can follow to think about whether this evidence is strong, weak, or, uh, or mm -hmm. moderate. Um, how do we analyze this voluminous database efficiently, and how do we avoid this bias I spoke of earlier? So um, we've developed a set of, key of keywords and mesh terms. These are being actually revised currently by Lu Ping Zhang and Kate Guyton are being expanded and used more. Um, and you then can put those into your basically your favorite organizing program. This can be, uh, it's Hawk, uh, uh, it's called Hawk. It's an open software at IARC, but there are other systems like SysRev, which uses AI to organize these things. But the way that this works is you're able to look at the relevance of the literature. This is for 1900 benzene. And then you break them down into key characteristics and you'll find that there are 
relatively smaller number of papers then that you can assign a subgroup of two or three people to look at and make decisions about and bring the whole thing together quite uh, efficiently. So it facilitates this review. It may be placed or assisted in the development of MOAs and AOPs and networks. And as I mentioned, it may actually improve predictive toxicology and molecular epidemiology for disease prevention if we can develop the appropriate assays and biomarkers to measure them. And this uh, is the idea again that um, we need basically the big thing that needs to happen now is the development of tests or the description of already existing tests and their assignment to particular KCs and understanding that we're looking at the complete picture when we test chemicals. I think, of, for example, for endocrine disrupting chemicals, we may actually be missing a lot of um, possible effects on things that are not usually tested for. And this may be true also for environmental chemicals for cardiotoxicity uh, and um, uh, perhaps others also. So um, to finish, basically, uh, one thing that we have noticed is that there, and probably you also, is that there are overlaps in um, between male and female reproductive toxicants, EDCs, neurotox, and key characteristics of carcinogens. We have noticed that, for example, epigenetics alterations commonly comes up as does oxidative stress and inflammation. And receptor mediated effects are obviously altered as a cell proliferation. And so this suggests that there may actually be a common set of um, key characteristics of bioactive hazardous chemicals. And so if you think about how this could work, you could think of about the idea of two, there being two tiers of testing, one being if we take tests for these particular endpoints that we're talking about here, and all these key characteristics that are common to many types of toxicity, we could start with that as a first tier and say, if it gets past that, we could then do a second tier of tests that are specifically for things like developmental neurotoxicity or endocrine disruption. And so we could have uh, multiple tiers of tests that actually uh, informed us very quickly about, about uh, the hazards of chemicals. And um, this is a paper that we're working on right now um, that shows the associations between the key characteristics of uh, carcinogens in C, endocrine disrupt disruptors in E, female reproductive toxicants in F, and male reproductive toxicants in, in M. Some of them have no correlations with other types of KCs, but um, you can see that there is great deal of overlap in the top left corner of cases and in different of these different types. And if you look at something specific like epigenetics, um, you can see the correlation with epigenetics in endocrine disruption with that in carcinogens in male and female reproductive toxicants. So there's direct <clears throat> interaction. Similarly for receptors, which you, we, know, we know is important in, in cancer, uh, uh, the eighth key characteristic, this links with four of the endocrine disruptors, uh, the first female reproductive toxicant, KC, and the male one. And similarly, in hormone signaling, looking at that from uh, female number one, you can see that there are multiple connections to the endocrine disrupting chemicals. And so there are uh, shared and common key characteristics, and there are also unique ones for these different things. And this um, has implications, I think, for toxicity testing moving forward and understanding the hazards of, of chemicals. And with that, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, I'm happy to talk about this and uh, discuss uh, with you, uh, answer any questions. I want to thank uh, the California EPA, especially Lauren Zeiss, for their support of this, which was also supported by the NIH, NIHS uh, um, Superfund research grant that I have, um, especially Catherine Guyton of IARC. And finally, I want to thank uh, some of you who are on this call and also all the people who have contributed so far, completely free, uh, completely without any compensation, um, except for... Um, economy class travel in uh, in coach on southwest or something like that um, and um, 
Uh, there's been 90 people, 43 institutions, and 11 countries to date that have participated it in this. I think this shows um, the great deal of interest in this particular approach and also um, the willingness of people to give their time uh, in developing this approach further, for which I'm very grateful. And thank you for again for inviting me.